Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Charles Green and I'm part of the marketing team here at Belactric Software and I'm going to be your host today. Today we're going to be discussing how to best scope and estimate your user experience project. Now arguably this is one of the least enjoyable parts of working in the field of UX, but it is however critically important. And as we're going to talk about, about later, the majority of projects are not delivered on time or on budget. So we need to get a lot better at scoping and estimating. And this is also particularly important for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because today UX is no longer the narrow field of simply developing a compelling user interface for your software, but it's rather a rich, multidisciplinary area encompassing innovation and product and service design. In other words, it's getting increasingly complex. And secondly, it's important because UX is one of the top priorities for product developers and for organizations in 2016. Customers simply expect that they will intuitively understand how to use your software, and if they don't, they're going to rapidly move on to using your competitors' products or services. And that's precisely why I'm delighted to be joined today by Bruno Wilches, who is going to be sharing his expertise and some of the best practices that he's developed over uh, his many years of experience for scoping and estimating UX projects. Now, Bruno leads our UX practice here at Bellatrix. He has extensive experience in the digital business area. He's worked in the internet industry uh, for over 10 years, managing web and mobile products. And prior to joining Bellatrix a few years ago, he started and managed a company dedicated to providing web, acts, web apps for global clients. He currently works with our customers in defining their strategies, helping, with, helping them with their roadmaps, coordinating teams, and of course prototyping websites and applications. But before we jump into the content, I should remind you that we're, we're very open to taking questions during the session today. We're going to be presenting for, for the next 35 or 40 minutes, uh, and afterwards we will have a dedicated time for Q&A. But also during the, the presentation, do feel free to ask us, ask us a question. And you can do that either via the chat box on your screen, on the bottom right hand side of your screen, or via Twitter. We're going to be live tweeting throughout using the hashtag BestUX2016. But let's, uh, without further ado, let's jump right into the content. And first up, uh, we want to, want to discuss planning. You know, right at the very start, when you're considering your UX project, you need to consider uh, how to plan it and what you want to be doing in the future. So Bruno, what would you say, uh, what should we take into consideration when planning our project? Well, first, Charles, uh, thank you for having me here today. And planning UX projects, as, as, as you said, is a, it's the key element here. Um, I would say it's a balance between getting the right amount of user input within the, the constraints of your project. Um, so the, the trick would be to work out the best use of, of your time, if you're a, a designer, or, or your money, if you're the one hiring them. So it is fair to, to wonder um, how can you get the most UX goodness for the budget you have. Um, so this comes to thinking about uh, how the best planning can be done. And I think that the best planning phase is all about understanding what you need to do and working out the best combination of, of activities that will give you the outcome you need. And of course, within the time um, budgetary and, and resource constraints of, of your project. Uh, it's important to think about constraints and it's our job as UX professionals to deliver the best user experience within those constraints. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know we have some data here, so some data from the, the Standage Group uh, Chaos Report from a couple of years ago. And that was a study conducted you know, on projects across many industries. And here the results showed that only 39% of the projects were successful in delivering a result on time and within budget. 43% meanwhile were challenged, meaning they had to scramble or find extra resources. And the rest, 18%, failed outright. They ran out of money or time before they could deliver. That kind of really echoes what you just said there, um, Bruno, but are you, are you surprised by those figures? They're definitely striking, Charles. Um, but actually, I'm not surprised. And, and even I'm sure that most of those projects uh, probably had talented, hardworking teams. But 
to me, the difference may come down to a scoping and, and estimating well, something that sounds obvious, uh, but it's easier said than done. And I think that's why we're all gathered here today. Yeah, abs absolutely. Um, so, so why is it so hard? Why do so many companies struggle with this? Well, you know, Charles, um, unfortunately, one of the most difficult things to get right, and even for more the most experienced UX designers or project managers, um, is correctly estimating the UX project. Um, estimating is always fraught with, with assumptions, uh, what ifs, unknowns, so you can imagine why accurately estimating UX projects is important. But to be honest with you, no one likes estimating projects. Uh, it's difficult and, and, and not as, as much fun as doing the work itself, you know. But however, um, what I think that is that without an accurate estimate, it's impossible to know how much budget you need to allocate and, and what are the variables that will impact the final pricing for the work to be done. And this can be even harder for, for digital products that, that, that we are used to, to working on. Uh, to work on because unlike a physical product for which the break-even value can be calculated based on the sum of the parts and manufacturing costs, design work is, is much harder to price. Uh, you're, you're either selling or, or you're being sold skills, experience, uh, process, and informed decision making. So how do you put a price on that? How do you know if the price is right and, and you'll get the value for the dollar you're paying? Yeah, absolutely. And we, we know that um, the price, even though um, it shouldn't be the number one criteria, it is still very important. Um, it is very important for companies when looking at UX to make sure they're um, getting a, you know, the appropriate price. And I know you've done some other webinars in the past about cost-effective UX, for example. Um, so, so what are the pricing models available and what are their advantages? So that's, that's a good question. Um, there are many pricing models, but I think they can come down into two very different patterns. Um, one of the, the most common models is the, the, the hourly rate, and the other one, I think it's a fixed price. Um, getting charged uh, an hourly rate, and, and also known as uh, assignment materials, is the easiest method to understand, because you can simply track the time it takes to do the work and, and get charged for that time at the end of a project, or, or maybe agreed milestones. And while this is great for the designer, you as the client will harbor all the risk in the situation. Um, if, for example, the project overruns due to underestimating changes in, in the scope, uh, you know that the clock keeps running. So it is typically typically rare for clients to, to agree to pay by time and materials on, on large projects due to the risk. But it might be more common for, for much smaller work. Um, but something that, 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 that I think it's, it's from another approach is that time and materials is prone to be a reactive model. Um, what I mean here is that you will have to be very careful and have a great sense of confidence with, with the designer or the UX design firm as you can start the race between cutting costs from your side and increasing billable hours from the other. So that is why usually the client decides what needs to get done, creating this uh, reactive model that might not suit you best. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in which case using a uh, time materials model, you know, while it may be popular, it may not necessarily be your best bet. So do you recommend perhaps using a, a fixed price model instead? Well, uh, it depends. Uh, the, the, the the right question is, it depends. Uh, for example, if you're working with a, with a freelancer with an hourly rate, it might not be the best way to go for, for many projects. Uh, freelancers usually don't have long-term commitment uh, to, to, to either your product or, or to your business. So in that case, it's, it, it's common to be inclined to work with specialized UX solution providers on a fixed bid. Uh, a flat price is great. For, for, for your client's standpoint. Um, you can understand up front what you'll need to pay and, and you know there will be no surprises, you know. And this approach uh, also moves the risk away from you and, and places it 
into the design firm hands. So what you get there, Charles, is that, that you know you will, be, you will be dealing with professionals according to the type of proposal you get. Um, as you can safely assume that they know what they're doing and they're comfortable taking some risks. So with that in mind, uh, the design firm company will strive to get the full scope of work right before agreeing to a fixed price schedule. Um, and you know what? That's very good news for you because maybe you don't know exactly where to start or, or probably you know, have, don't have an idea of, of how much budget you need to allocate. So expert companies will help you work with that. Okay, excellent. That's very helpful. But as you said there, you know, maybe uh, maybe the companies or the the organisation they don't really know exactly where to start, or you know, you, you're still um, it's still very much you know, perhaps an, at, a, at the idea stage, and it's difficult perhaps to to fully grasp exactly what you plan to do um, in, in within the projects. So how do you suggest working when you do, when you don't have much information available? Well, that's that's a great question. It reminds me of a client we had recently. Um, they knew that they had a problem, but when, when we asked them to, to strictly point out where they were, they, they couldn't tell exactly. So uh, it's very, very common that, that clients don't know actually what needs to be changed. So they may have a rough idea that they have problems, but when asked to point them, it's, it's, it's difficult, as I said. Or maybe they don't even have a product yet that needs change because the product doesn't exist at all and what, what, what you need is to draft the steps that will get to building the right thing. So how do you hire an expert solution provider uh, to do that? So in many ways, uh, the planning of UX projects can become a design challenge in its own right. Um, you have an outcome that you need to get um, and, and it's up to you which approach to take to, to get you there. So you need to be confident that the tools and, and techniques you choose or, or your uh, UX service provider chooses for you will be the right ones to get you the insight you need within the constraints of your project as we, as we talked before. Because the, the beauty of UX projects is that there's always something you can do to add value regardless of the budget. So maybe a low budget might, might result more in a light touch and get real approach, whereas um, a low budget may allow you to do more extensive use of research. Um, if you can, you should always try to, to provide an idea of the budget you have as it will save you both um, you and, and, and your solution provided time and an extra cost by avoiding recutting proposals. But I know that's that may not be something easy to do, is, especially if you're not confident with your provider. In, in that case, you might want to expect fewer different options if, if you're not ready to disclose your budget um, or even something that is absolutely outside of your ballpark figure that you have in your head for, for your project. But the idea always is no, no matter how, how much money or how little money you have, the key principle for your, all UX projects is that you must ensure that you involve users in the design process. In, in, in some way, you know, in some way you, you need to involve users. Challenge yourself to see how you can work within the constraints of the projects to involve users as much as possible. So user involvement will not only improve the output of the project itself, but will also help you to inform decision making, which can often delay projects, you know, Charles. Yeah, abs absolutely. Um, so you've just dis you discussed there how you can work when you have little information, um, but of course you know um, learning to, to budget is just you know one part of the, the problem that you're faced, right? The other part, of course, is how do you estimate how much time you're going to need? So what would you suggest here? What what do you suggest to our, to our listeners? Well, it, it, that, that's right. Um, the budget is just half of the problem. The other one, of course, is time. So uh, we'll try to break it down for, for all the audience here today because there is actually no secret formula and, and even the most senior experienced US, UX designers or, or largest UX firms haven't worked it out to an exact science yet. But, you know, Charles, uh, 
that's okay. That's that's okay because UX implies a multidisciplinary work on one hand and on the other, the users. And we're all people and, and, and people are, are not um, an exact science, as I said before. Um, we we all we all know that although we might have a rough idea about what your user base behavior would look like, the bottom line is that they will still have this quota of unpredictability. Mm -hmm, right. But even when you have that quota of unpredictability, there must surely be some techniques that perhaps you can use uh, to guess more accurately, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and if you like, I can show you a few tips uh, and techniques that, that we can only imply to, to help you make uh, a more informed guess and get as soon as possible, as, as close as possible, sorry. Um, one of the first things that I might say is that you should have a defined process or, or a know it inside out. Whether you're the one kind of shots in, in, in all UX related work or, or you're hiring uh, a specialized agency, if you already know how to undertake a UX project and are confident with the various techniques you can get you, you can use to get it done, uh, then you'll probably follow a similar process each time. So a key factor here is helping to estimate, a key factor here to, sorry, to, to, to help you accurately estimate the UX design project um, is having a clearly defined process with input and outputs, you know, so with deliverables and goals and, and benefits of all, of all those phases. Um, once you have a good handle of the process that is being proposed to you, uh, you'll be ma in much better place to predict how long each of those tasks will take, and, and therefore you, what you should expect from each stage too. So it's obvious that each job and its specific requirements are going to be unique, you know and the number of um, complexity of the techniques employed, deliverables, and depth uh, of planning maybe will maybe proportional Define process and, and, and start knowing it. You you should break it into pieces. Um, just as the, as the prospect of undertaking a large UX project can be can seem scary or daunting at first, uh, you can you you can think uh, about how that can be uh, daunting as well when 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 you're in the estimating phase. Um, so just as you would approach the project in a smaller, more manageable pieces to complete, the best way to estimate how long a U.S. project will take is to break the approach you plan to follow into small, achievable pieces. So you can list step by step the process you plan to follow for each particular stage or work. So the more granular you get, the better it is. Right, I understand. I assume that is something which we're doing at Bellatrix, right? Yes, absolutely. We, we do this for every project we estimate here at Bellatrix, and what we usually do is start with a, with a simple scribble on, on a piece of paper that follows a fairly standard UX design process, and then become more granular and develop the list uh, of tasks required to achieve the specific requirements established for, for each uh, unique project. You know, and okay. talking about each unique project, I, I'm, I'm reminding myself of, of another tip I had today for you, that is to 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 record and review the data from from all the past projects you have. We know that nobody likes filling out their their timesheet, but the only way to know if the projects you estimated was accurate is to to complete the project and record how long it took to finish its, each task. And the more projects you finish, the more data you can gather to inform future estimates. You know, So if you're hiring a, a UX design company, be sure to read the, their case studies to learn how much effort and time 
they've dedicated into each phase for, for, for past projects. And you can also ask them questions regarding this topic, and, and I'm sure they'll be happy to answer them. Um, and I have a final tip, uh, and, and I me mentioned it earlier, and it was about the, the disclosing the budget you may have for, for your project. So if you already have an allocated budget for your UX project, I know it can be difficult to, to say it, to, to the company, but you might find value in telling it to your expert company. Uh, because if you let them know your possibilities and what you're expecting to, to spend, uh, it will be easy to work out the available time afforded and work back from there to define an approach that, that, that fits and, and works for you, adding real value. So it's no use if you're not on the same page. So this figure will ultimately help you both you and the, and the UX expert company to determine what you'll have time to cover and what needs to be left out of scope for the time being. So it's actually a great way to prioritize if you're still in the dark. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think there are some very, some very useful tips uh, for helping us estimate uh, more accurately. But one thing which um, stood out for me was that you mentioned when talking about what some of the work we do at Bellatrix is that um, you, know, we, you know we follow um, a pretty standard UX design process and then we become more granular and, and then we develop you know, the lists of tasks which are required. So perhaps now is a good a uh, good time to pivot to discuss what are the typical UX project phases. What does a typical UX proposal look like? Yes, that's, that's a very important point. Um, you know, researching and, and learning what a UX proposal looks like is usually a smart thing to do. I, I encourage every everyone here in the audience to do it. Because if you're, if you're hiring a serious UX solution provider, you will realize that the, the proposal, as you say, is always broken into phases. So UX projects typically, typically consist of, according to me actually, three main phases. Uh, a research phase that where you and, and, and your provider immerse yourself in the project to, to get the background they'll need to make the design decisions later in the project. So do, during this phase, UX solution provider, providers will try to learn as much as your business the objectives, users, and, and competitors as possible. Uh, following that, um, you, you'll have a design phase that will, the, the UX solution provider will work out how and, and, and what they are dis, the, the, their designing, what, what their designing will work and how it will fit together. So this phase will define the scopes, uh, features, functionality, and, and how it behaves. So it's kind of a, a design hypothesis that you will have. And the design hypothesis has to be validated in the next phase. Um, with the validation phase, you, 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 you identify whether that process that you came up with in the design phase actually works with it, its intended audience. So this phase is typically followed by further runs of design and testing iteratively to solve the problems you, you will find when you test with users. So what I think is that using a research design and validation framework helps you structure projects and, un and better understand the scope and the budget you'll need and the time you will be allowing the, the UX projects, projects to, to go on for. Mm -hmm. And I assume, similar to before, this is again something which we are following at Bellatrix. Yes, what we usually do is that we often start working out the approach we would ideally like to take and then calculate how long we would need to do that work and then adjust the methods, tools and techniques to fit into the, the constraints of the project. And those constraints, what kind of constraints would, um, would you typically come across? Well. There are multiple constraints. Um, they may include factors uh, such as uh, budget, as we talked before, time available, uh, delivery deadlines, um, resource availability. Sometimes you need some resources that are not easily gotten. Uh, the information avail uh, availability um, related projects that, that may come into, into play here, the access to certain tools, 
and legal paperwork that can delay the whole thing. So what what I was what I would say is that regardless of, of the constraints, uh, you must be able to focus on the objectives of the projects and, and how you can deliver the best user experience that, that meets those, those objectives. So often, this is the, the true and, and, and hidden you know, skill of a great UX professional. And, and, and as I said before, remember, some, some UX work is better than no UX work at all. So, once you receive that proposal that defines the approach to take, it will be much easier for you to understand the real value and to engage in conversations about maybe flexing project constraints, such as increasing the scope of the project or maybe change your, your original plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. I think that's very helpful to often in many cases, you know, you, companies will be faced with, you know, a series of constraints when they're looking to, uh, to develop develop their, their UX projects, that's, that's very helpful. I want to, uh, again, to pivot here, and I know you've prepared you know, the five top tips uh, for our listeners today to help them scope and estimate better. Um, so I would like to now, now to really go through each of those one by one uh, to discuss you know, what are the real five takeaways that our listeners should be taking from today's webinar. Yes, absolutely. Um, let's go to, to number one. Um, we talked about this earlier, but I think it's important to understand that the product scope, the project scope, and, and estimates are completely separate things. You, as a client, ultimately own product scope. And that is the, the determination of what is going to be delivered. It's up to you. Clients and agencies work together to agree on what work each will do to get there, you know, but which is, that is the project scope, and it's not the same. So the agency owns the estimate of how long their part of the work will take and how much it will, it will cost. So each of these elements exists in relationship with the others, and they must be created and adapted in tandem uh, as the project proceeds. So, once you understand that there are separate things, it's important to make sure everyone understands the scope. And speaking of having everyone in sync, uh, sometimes some players get ahead of what others on the team can follow. So that leads to confusion and, and maybe miss requirements. Um, so especially with, with UX, that is somehow a new world now. So avoid dumping or, or if you're on the other side, accepting a big pile of documentation to communicate scopes is you can lose up 80% of the information between disciplines and many people won't read it or fully understand it. So if you end up approving a big document because you're just too lazy to read it or you don't have time, you can create a full sense of security for an agency. And ultimately, for everyone to win, you as a client must be happy with the end result. Uh, whatever paper may have passed back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so once we understand that scope, then going to be the key stakeholders who should be involved in the scoping. Uh, yeah, uh, stakeholders uh, are, are important. And uh, you, should, you should understand that stakeholders come from, from multiple parts. Your users are stakeholders. The ones that will be using the, the design will be a, a, one of the stakeholders. The delivery team and all people on, at your company who, who will approve and operate the end product are the, 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 the stakeholders. So when scoping uh, is a collaborative, transparent activity that everyone involved can see problems early on and make decisions together for the, for the good of a project, you're doing the right things. Uh, but otherwise, there's a risk of, of ending up in an adversarial relationship where each party, as I said before, suspects the other one is trying to shake them down for extra money or, or output. So that's not a good thing to, to do. But as we discussed before, Charles, if you have an estimate that breaks down the, the work, the detailed list of tasks, um, you're, you will be better uh, at scoping and identifying the stakeholders. So 
the idea is if you if you try to shortcut an estimate by using a number based on, on the gut feeling, uh, counting features, and then using a multiplier or compare, comparing to past projects that seem similar, uh, results in estimate them don't probably account for the techniques uh, for the unique challenges of a given project. So instead, uh, make a detailed list of the tasks that need to be completed and estimate each. That's very important to get that from your client standpoint. Uh, but you know, even though you can break down tasks, um, you, you you should expect some uncertainty levels. But what you should do is ask them in estimates. UX projects are complex, and not, not everything can be devised early on. So allow for some uncertainty and expect the agency to add some part of risk, maybe. Um, however, what I, what I recommend is to, to raise your hand if you see something like 400 hours. So if you see something like that, you can um, raise a red flag. You should ask for, for ranges, like 300 to 500 hours. So each item in the work breakdown should potentially have a different range based on the level of uncertainty around it. It's not the same for every phase. So larger ranges usually indicate areas of risk, the risk, uh, sorry, that should be top priorities for deeper, deeper upfront exploration. Um, I think that that's very important, and, and if you have a, a proposal like that, you'll you'll know that you're dealing with a with an expert agency. Excellent. Thank you, Bruno. Um, I think that really brings us now to um, nearly to the end of the the formal part of the presentation, and you know today we, we've discussed a range of issues. We've um, we've spoken about why is estimating and scoping so difficult. Uh, we've discussed about you know some of the pricing models which are available. We've discussed what do you do when you have little information. How do you make the, the estimates for for you know. Uh, assessing how much time you're going to need for this particular project. Um, we've discussed some of the techniques that you can use to guess more accurately given some, um, you know, if you're in a certain situation where you don't have that much information, how can you uh, guess more accurately. Uh, Bruno has also discussed um, some of the key UX project phases and just now he's gone through you know, some of the five key lessons uh, in order to scope and to estimate better. So I want to remind all our listeners at the moment that if you do have a question, uh, please do ask us. Um, you can, and you can again, you can do that either via the chat box on the bottom right hand side of your screen, or you can use Twitter and just use the hashtag BestUX2016, and then we will see the question and we will get to that um, as soon as possible. And actually, I see that we already have a question from, from one of our listeners, and that question is, if a client does not have a defined project, do you charge for the scope, and or should you charge for the scope? Well, Charles, I, I think that's a wonderful question. Uh, question. Thanks for, for bring, bringing it up. Um, uh, you know, it depends on, on the company, but what I think is you should find the, find the balance there. Uh, sometimes you don't require to go in a very detailed or thorough um, estimation because the project is very familiar for you. But sometimes the project is not. I mean, uh, maybe the, they have foreign terms and um, technology or even um, uh, a discipline or a scope that you don't know. So I think if you want to do a, sheer, a serious job there when you the, the, when the risk level is high, I think you should take the time to do it. And what I believe what I believe is that as a client you should expect for some um, for for some charge there. I'm not saying that you should take for example um, two, three, four months to estimate and for, for scoping the project, but maybe one week or two weeks of full work it's ne are necessary. So if you're the client, you should expect um, some charge there. And you know what? It, it can be a sign of a good 
uh, of a good thing because if you're being charged for th for something, you should expect a very detailed scope after that, a very detailed estimate that will show you that you're dealing with a serious player. If you have a, an estimate right away, you may raise red flag there because maybe you're getting ballpark figures and they're, they're, the company is having a, um, a big pattern risk because they don't want to to immerse in the in the job that it needs to, to be done in all the work that needs to be done to estimate it correctly so the, 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 the answer the final answer should be sometimes yes you charge for scope in the project and that's not such a bad thing for you as a client Okay, and actually we have a, a very similar question to that uh, from another listener, and that is, how much effort should they be making in understanding and developing the scope? I think you kind of touched on that a little bit, but perhaps you can delve into a bit more detail about that. Yes, yes. Um, the it's important. Uh, the effort should be should be the necessary, you know, no more or no uh, no less. But what you should do, I think, is uh, to drive toward a comprehensive understanding of a scope as early as possible, and um, whatever it takes. Um, it is, uh, you know, calculated that range to 30 to 50 percent in risk and then 10 to 25 percent savings in the final project cost can be achieved by spending the time and money to do early and aggressive scoping. So you are the client as. as as I discussed in the previous question, uh, if you're if you're spending money for that scoping, you should know that that money will be saved uh, later on. So, scope is set in stone at that point. But it's important to have everyone in sync on a clear initial plan and its underlying assumptions that you may have. So that team can simply iterate on, on, on it going forward, you know. Excellent, thank you. Um, let's just see if any more questions, just again as a reminder, please do um, type in your question using the chat box or via Twitter using the hashtag bestUX2016. Uh, let's just see if any more questions come in. Um, and we actually we have just one question that's coming. Um, if we, and the question is, if we are using Agile, is it harder to scope and estimate? Uh, no, no, absolutely no. Uh, actually, it, it would be it would be wrong if you go with an uh, with a waterfall approach. Uh, waterfall approach has been dead for nearly nearly ten years. So it's the agile era. So you should frame your project into an iterative agile fashion, um, and and to set scope and and estimates once, just once at the start of a project and never revisit them is, is asking for trouble, you know. So scope and estimate uh, should be verbs, in my opinion. So there should be processes that, that a project team engages in on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent, thank you. And we actually, we just have another question, which I think, again, it, it touches a little bit on what you've already spoken about, Bruno. Um, I think it's, it's an interesting question because, you know, as you said, it, you know, making, uh, you know, trying to effectively scope and estimate is is challenging in itself. And the question is, how do you feel about scope creep? It, it, it can change. It's not set. It, it's not set in stone. But if you if you if you find yourself having a lot of scope creeps, maybe you're you're not doing doing the the, the right amount or, or the the exact work you you should do in the scoping phase. Um, you should not have this this. This, this scripts if you if you define it and then you
document Okay, excellent. Thank you, Bruno. Um, I see we don't have any further questions at this time. Let's just give it um, a few more, uh, a few more seconds to see if any any questions do come in. Um, but whilst we're waiting, um, I would like to mention to everyone on the line today that this is really this webinar is part of UX Month at Bellatrix. So UX Month is really um, a series of webinars, blogs, and articles all about user experience. So if you haven't already, I encourage you to go to our blog, check out the, the, the launch of UX Month, uh, which is our, our latest blog. Um, we'll be publishing a, um, a further blog about UX on next Monday. Um, and we also have a further upcoming webinar all about the design principles for UX, um, where we're going to be examining the difference between UX and graphic design, as well as how they are related. And that webinar is going to be in two weeks' time on Wednesday, the 30th of March. Um, but I see we have... Um, see if we have any further questions. Um, I think that's actually that's actually it. Uh, Bruno, do you have any uh, any final comments you'd like to leave the listeners with? No, I think we 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 pretty much cover a, a lot of ground today, and, and I'm open for follow up questions after this webinar. Okay, excellent. Well, firstly, many thanks to you for, for sharing your expertise today. Thank you to all our listeners who've uh, taken time out of your schedule to join us today. Um, if you do have any questions that you uh, didn't get a chance to ask, um, please uh, please do let us know and we'll get, we'll get to that after this call. Um, but with that, I would like to say thank you to everyone for participating today and wish everyone a very pleasant day. Okay, thank you Charles, thank you everybody.